Good evening. Welcome to the eighth presentation of Avalanche Canada's webinar series. Hi there, my name is Brent Strand. I'm going to be your producer for the evening, and we have Nancy Geismar and Jennifer George that are going to be the moderators that are going to be running our chat questions box for you tonight. With COVID, it's meant that, you know, once it kicked in, we weren't allowed to do face-to-face -face outreach anymore. We couldn't go out into the public and, you know, do those face-to-face -face presentations. But with this new webinar format, we've been able to reach so many more people. It's been fantastic, the turnout we've been getting. And you know, our main mission here at Avalanche Canada is to help educate backcountry users so that you can go out and play safe. We want everyone to know more, go farther, and come home every day. You know, if it wasn't for our sponsors, you know, we're very thankful for their financial support. You know, if it wasn't during these economic climate that's very challenging with COVID, it's hard to reach new backcountry users. And with their support, it's been fantastic. A few housekeeping notes, folks. Um, you're all muted when you come in. There's gonna be opportunities to ask questions. So uh, to ask a question, you just hit the little raise hand button there in your webinar chat box thing. And uh, then we'll go there, we'll unmute you. You can ask your question, talk to the presenter, and then get some rapport. And then we're gonna meet you back up and move on. Another way is to type in the question chat box which is also in the GoTo dashboard there down at the bottom. And uh, those are a couple of ways that you can get interactive with our presentations. So today's presentation is riding out of bounds, what you need to know. Um, with that being said, this year, it's a pretty pressing topic this year with COVID in the air and people trying to distance themselves. We all wanna get outside. Sales of snowmobiles, ski gear, snowshoeing gear, it's off the charts. Everyone's sold out of stock. And not to mention, when we go out there, that's the ever alluring fresh powder on the other side of the boundary lines when we're out at the ski hills and such. We wanna ensure that all of you folks can be prepared before you go and duck that rope. So with that being said, we have a huge, awesome team of knowledgeable presenters tonight. We've got three folks coming up tonight. Amy Ertel is a pro patroller from Whistler Blackcomb, as well as one of our youth ambassadors. Amy's gonna give you the goods on the do's and the don'ts of riding out of bounds. Since she's the one that might be out there saving your butt one night to try and come upon and save you if you go out there unprepared. We don't want that. Then we're gonna come back to Rebel Stoke and we're gonna hear from legendary Greg Hill. He's got too many accomplishments to list from tons of 10,000 foot days, 100 kilometer vert in a month and 2 million vert in a year. Greg's a professional athlete. He's a ski environmentalist. He's an ACM ACMG guide who spends a lot of time in the snow. Greg's gonna share his knowledge he's gained through his decades of experience. And then we're gonna wrap things up with pro skier, Chris Rubens. He also calls Revelstoke his home. And he shared his passion of skiing with many places from around the world and right here in our own backyard mountains. Chris has been an amazing avalanche ambassador for us since its inception. Um, he's extremely passionate about skiing, wants to share that knowledge to help keep you safe on your adventures. There's going to be a bunch of time for some Q&A at the end, folks. So keep those questions handy. Get ready to get interactive. I'm going to just pop up one more little video here, you guys, about all our Avalanche ambassadors that we pumped out here about last year into the season or so. So we're just going to do that. And after that, we're going to dive into those presentations. So I hope you enjoy the evening. I'm here at the ski area boundary, and this is a big decision-making point for me. When I'm inbounds, I got people looking after me, I can have all the fun in the world, but as soon as I cross that line, things change. I'm making those decisions, and I need to be with people that make those good decisions as well. So if I'm going out of bounds, the first thing I'm gonna do in the morning is I'm gonna check Avalanche Canada. And they have great bulletins with tons of information about snowpack. And it's gonna help me with the information that I need to know which terrain I wanna avoid, what's going on with the snowpack. And that's the start of my day. Whenever I go in the backcountry, I make sure that I have a reliable communication device, whether that's my cell phone and it's fully charged and I know I have service, or I bring another communication device like a radio or a spot. I'm only going out of bounds with you if you have your beacon, shovel, and probe. And more importantly, know how to use all three of those. You can never practice too much. 
I never follow tracks if I don't know where they go, and I always know how to get back in bounds. Following tracks can get you in a lot of trouble because they don't necessarily know where they're going. I'm only going in the backcountry with you unless you have at least your AST level one. I want to know that you have my back as much as I have your back. I'm always aware of changing conditions and I'm never afraid to speak up if I'm feeling uncomfortable about the terrain or choices that we're making. I have the training to recognize avalanche terrain and know how to travel in it safely. If I'm leaving the ski area boundary, I have my avalanche gear, but I'm also prepared to spend the night out there. I don't know if I might have an equipment failure, an avalanche or an injury, but if I don't have the right gear, it's gonna be a very long, cold night out there. Awesome. Excellent. Well, we're going to hand it off to our first presenter, Amy Artell, and she's going to come on right now. Welcome, Amy. You're good to go there, Amy. Great. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking about out of bounds and kind of what that looks like more from an operational side and what that difference is between being in bounds and out of bounds. So first of all, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm 19 years old. I'm a volunteer ski patroller on Black Hole Mountain. I'm also a nursing student and I'm a downhill mountain bike racer. And I grew up here in Whistler, uh, which is pretty good stomping grounds for all the good times outside. Ski area boundary, let's get started with that. Um, first of all, I'm sure, or I hope that most of you guys have seen these signs around. Basically what this means, it's an area that you're entering that's not patrolled. Uh, the terrain is unmaintained, so you're at hazards for avalanches, cliffs, rocks, tree wells, all of those things, um, and they're not gonna be marked and not gonna be controlled. When you cross that boundary, you're going to be at your own risk. Um, so having the tools that you need to get yourself out of a tricky situation and being with the right people to help you do so. You're also going to deal with some pretty extreme weather. Um, a big part of being in the backcountry, a lot of people want to summit those mountains and get to some new places. And when you're getting far back there, or getting to the top of those mountains, you're going to encounter some pretty extreme conditions um, so being prepared with that it like i said it all ties together with having the right gear and being with the right people you just want to be prepared for anything that the elements could throw at you um, so being prepared is planning your trip ahead of time talking to the right people and understanding what your route plan is um, who you're going to be with what the group is looking like and understanding where those landmarkings are, um, having a GPS or some way to, to track where you're headed, checking Avalanche Canada, checking those min reports, talking to as many people as you can and just getting all that information. Um, education wise, it's really important for everyone to have their AST1 at least before they enter into that backcountry terrain. Uh, AST2 is really great too, and Ops1 course is awesome. And to have some first aid knowledge is really beneficial because you never know what, what you guys can get into out there. Um, being prepared for the possibility of getting lost. When you're out somewhere new, things look different every time, no matter how many times you've traveled somewhere or whether it's a completely new area. Um, there's always the possibility for ending up somewhere where you didn't think you were supposed to or just completely getting lost. So having things like some extra layers, some more food, some more water um, for those extended periods of time outside because it does get cold when you're outside and weather can change, weather can roll in, the lighting can completely change and you could get into a pretty sticky situation out there. So being prepared for the worst. Um, in your pack, you should be carrying your avalanche gear. So that's your transceiver, shovel, and probe. Um, all really important things and knowing how to use those. You should have extra food, extra water. Some extra clothes is good to have. Like I said, if you're gonna be outside for an extended period of time, it's nice to stay warm. Having a sat phone if you're uh, out of cell range or having a fully charged cell phone is really beneficial as well. 
in case if you do run into an injury or a gear failure and you're going to be stuck way out there, you want to be able to contact help. And having first aid um, pack in, in your backpack is really good too because, like I said, you never know when things can come up. So when you're planning, you want to think about your route plan, um, checking in with people that have traveled those routes, people that live in those areas, um, just really planning that out and, and understanding where you're going so you aren't just following tracks blindly. When you get to somewhere and you've been planning on skiing this face, you've been wanting to ski for a really, really long time and you thought that it was going to be the day, you have to be okay with turning around if uh, you assess the terrain and, and you're not feeling confident about that, you want to be okay with turning around. So traveling with a group with um, a familiar mindset is, is really important for sure because you want to understand that everyone's got the same mindset and understand that safety is the number one priority. We all want to get home at the end of the day and return to our families. So it's, it's really important to be with a good group and understand where you're going. So inbounds, um, something that we do on behalf of Ski Patrol is we do our own forecasting as well. Um, so we have a weather team that heads up in the morning. They're out uh, in the field. They're checking the, the plan for the, for the day, seeing what the snow's doing, seeing cornices are building, um, ski cutting, seeing what's going on, just getting all the information that we can. Um, to build a forecast for that day and for the upcoming few days. So ways that we can control avalanches is through bombing. Um, I personally have not been able to go out on avalanche control as I'm a volunteer ski patroller. So I don't have too, too much knowledge on that. Um, however, we all, most of us hear those bombs going off in the mornings. And it's pretty interesting to see those results that they can get out and see if um, that risk is as extreme as they thought or quite minimal. So it's a really good tool that we have to control that avalanche terrain and make it safe to the public. Another one, ski cutting. Um, when groups go out on routes, they're assessing the terrain by ski cutting and yeah just gathering as much data as possible to see what that safety hazard is at for the day we have a lot of signage up um we've got ropes signs and fences so we might have ropes or fences around um, obstacles big rocks cliffs signs for cliffs signs for unmarked rocks and obs rocks and obstacles like just all that signage that we can get out there just to prevent injury um, and obviously it's patrolled so we're always just a phone call away if your bindings fail or if you break your leg we're we're right there we're going to get to you as quickly as we can so in bounds we're constantly assessing terrain there's always ski patrollers out skiing around um, double checking that everything's safe we've got trail checks in the mornings we got sweeps at night so we're really always constantly assessing that terrain, making sure that no one's lost, no one's hurt, and making sure that it's safe um, for the public. We also have grooming. Um, this is a really good way that they're managing terrain to make it very friendly for our skier traffic and obviously snowmaking um, to help out for those times when we don't have as much natural snow. So that's some ways that are really different between inbound skiing versus out of bounds. Um, just bring a bit of light to those differences for when you do cross that boundary, these um, tools might not be there. So when you do cross the boundary, um, as I mentioned earlier, you want to know where you're going. You don't want to be following tracks. You want to make sure that you know where you're going ahead of time, whether there was tracks there or not. You want to know where you are. Um, and I can't stress that enough, the amount of times that I've seen people out in the backcountry. And I just see them following a good group of people. And you're like, do you guys know where you're going? And most of the time they're like, oh, I just saw some people going up here and it uh, looks pretty good. So that's always a really worrying thing for me, um, seeing people following tracks because there's this idea that, oh, backcountry skiing, you get uh, insane powder, untouched powder, and it's just the best thing ever. But there's a lot of risk that comes with it. 
Uh, with me growing up in Whistler, I've always felt like I've had really good respect for um, the mountains around us and understanding that there's quite a few elements that can be make skiing quite dangerous and we're playing with our luck sometimes. Um, so you just really want to respect that terrain, respect what Mother Nature is doing. And if you check Avalanche Canada that morning and that hazard's extreme, don't cross that boundary. You want you want to you want to come home at the end of the day. Don't push it. So you want to respect the mountain and the elements that come with it. As I mentioned earlier as well, um, being okay with turning around is so important. You really, really want to make sure that you're making the right decisions out there um, because you don't want to get caught in a tricky situation if it was avoidable by just turning around. Uh, being alert to changing conditions is super important because you could be heading out for a long, long day out there, um, a long approach, and you've been hoping to ski this couloir that you've been wanting to ski for a while, and all of a sudden some really gnarly winds come in, the light goes flat, or you're getting out there and you're planning on skiing a south-facing slope, and it's warmed up quite a bit. You just want to be alert to those changing conditions, and it's always planning around that. Um, having your plan for the day, but also understanding that that can change when you're out in the field. Getting lost, uh, when you're traveling to a new area, there's quite a bit of potential to get lost because you might not have been there before. Um, hopefully you're traveling in a group with people with someone who might has might have been there before. Um, there's a possibility that you're hoping to follow some signs, whether it's on resort or how to get to a boundary and you could get lost through that, also following tracks. And you wanna take your time um, to research your trip and where you're heading before you get there. You don't wanna be making those, I think it was supposed to be this way, but we also could have been going that way. Like you don't, you don't wanna have that when you're out there. You wanna be efficient and you wanna know the area and where you're traveling because there's so much hazardous terrain out there and you just really wanna make sure that you are where you're planning on being. Um, so in your pack, it's really important to have a transceiver. You want to, if you're in a group of people, it's nice to have a check-in, um, making sure that everyone's transceivers are transmitting, everyone's in transmit and not search. Um, you want to do a battery check. I always say I'll change my batteries if it gets 60 will be the lowest I'll, I'll let it ever be. Um, you just want to make sure that there's no room for error in your battery. Um, having a shovel and probe are two very important things. Um, everyone, I hope, knows how to use those. And if you don't, I hope that you're planning on learning how to use those before you get out into the backcountry. As, as Chris had mentioned in that video, um, he's always prepared for the possibility of spending the night out there. And you want to pack for that, um, having extra food, water, water and clothes and layers because it gets cold and you get hungry and you get dehydrated. And if you wanna have a successful um, emergency night, you wanna be prepared for it. Having a first aid kit, I can't stress that enough. Um, you can get your hands cut on your edges when you're just changing your skin, simple as that. So things, things to carry in your pack for sure. Um, also a sat phone if you're gonna be out of cell range. Tree wall hazards, you guys might have seen a sign similar to this um, at your local mountains, I hope. We put these out there when um, our forecasters or senior patrollers really feel that that's a, a imminent hazard for the day. So you'll see those at the bottom of the list, um, under highlighting that there is um, tree wall hazards out for the day. So when, they're, when the hazards are high is after a really big recent snowfall, um and understanding that tree wells can be a lot more dangerous than you think um highlighting in this picture that i have on the slide here it just looks like it could just be a tree you get too close and all of a sudden your head under five to ten feet you can go pretty deep um, you want to ski with a buddy and you always want to keep them in eyesight you don't want to be out on your own thinking that you're going to be okay because if you're going to get caught you are gonna be hoping that someone's gonna be right there to pull you out. A really important thing um, that I come across a lot is people's confusion between a closure and a boundary. This is a very clear line and should not be blurred. Um, when we have terrain closed, it is closed. That is not to be 
um, confused. You are not to cross a closure and if you do we can revoke your pass for that because it is a direct safety hazard to yourself or others. We close terrain for uh, avalanche control so if we are bombing that morning um, we're going to have that closed so if there's a slide that's not going to impact anyone else um, and that's some of the reasons why it takes a while to get those some of those alpine lifts turning in the morning because they're working on avalanche clearance and you want to make sure that that's closed to the public until we are positive that that is good to go. There's also permanent closures. Um, we have a decent amount of that on Blackcomb up high in the Alpine and that's just imposing a, um, a probable risk on yourself or another skier below. So those also do get maintained um, with, with bombing and yeah, those avalanche closures and permanent closures are not to be confused with the boundary. Those are a hard closure and you're not to cross that line. A ski area boundary, that is, as we've been speaking about tonight, um, that's a line where you can cross and you can go into the backcountry, assuming your own risks. And that's not somewhere where we can take your path. Um, that, is just, that is just a boundary. That's you assuming all of the risks at your own cost um, and being prepared to do so. Being with a group, here I am, my dad and one of his best friends. Um, we were heading out on a two-night hot trip. And when I started ski uh, sorry, ski touring, I was probably 14 or 15. And I never went with anyone other than my dad or his friends until I was probably 17 or 18, because they were the only people that I trusted. And um, I learned a lot from these guys. So I always knew that when I go out there, we're all going to be making the same decisions. They're great people to learn from, always making sure that I was learning as much as I could. Um, and they've made me who I am today. Um, so yeah, we want to be with good group members. You don't want to be going out with that person that's a bit of a, a loose unit. Um, you want to make sure that they're as educated as you are and yeah, willing to make those, those good decisions. Um, when you are out with a group, it's really good to have regular check-ins make sure everyone's feeling okay, whether that's the cardio on the way up or what you're about to drop into on the way down. Um, you just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page and you're not leaving anyone in the dust. And you want to all be able to recognize avalanche terrain, whether that's um, you dropping in first into a bowl. You want to know that you're not supposed to stop in a train trap at the bottom of the bowl while you watch your next group member go. You should all be on that same page, looking for those safe zones, um, making good decisions all together, and once again, being aware of those changing conditions. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, do I have any questions from the audience? Hey, Amy, it's Nancy here. Um, there's a question someone was asking, uh, I believe it was Scott. What do you carry in your first aid kit on the hill? Yeah, um, so with us on the hill, um, we have the resources to access a lot of um, quite advanced uh, gear. So we do also carry a bit more because um, we're uh, that's our job to to help people who are hurt. But if I'm heading out in the backcountry, um, my first aid kit is consisting of a tourniquet um, for big bleeds abdominal pads to help with those big bleeds. Um, I've got emergency blankets, band-aids. Um, what else do I have in there? Um, I got, I've got a couple of bars in there in case if someone's hitting a good bonk. I've got scissors, um, yeah, band-aids, gauze, ski straps, zap straps, gloves, just some of those things that you don't really want to be caught without. Um, but yeah, that's a, uh, that's pretty much all that I've got in there. Great, thanks, Amy. And another question um, from Nick. Where do you find backcountry gear for a 14-year-old? I'm thinking oh. maybe the same place where you'd find it for a 44-year-old, yeah. but do you have any thoughts on that? Think, yeah, I don't think there's too many like kid-specific things. Um, yeah, uh, when I first started ski touring, um, they, yeah, I used pretty much all the gear that 
I mean, all my stuff's been upgraded since then, but it's all been adult gear. There's not really any specific kids gear, maybe a, a smaller um, torso backpack, but I think that would be the only difference that it would make between adults and kids. Thanks. And um, I'm not sure if anyone out there has knowledge about sat phones or if there's a specific sat phone for riding in Canada that would be better than other sat phones. Not familiar with what would be best in Canada. Um, yeah, Garmin and InReach are kind of the ones that I've used um, and they've all been pretty good for, for what I'm aware of. <laughs> Hey, yeah, it's Brent here. Um, I know the Iridium system has been working quite well. They got a few more satellites up there in the last couple of years, um, but it swaps over between them and Garmin makes a model as well. And I think if you are getting a sat phone, you can talk to that provider and they're going to steer you in the right direction there, folks. Hey, Amy, I got one more. Mm -hmm. um, Diego's little brother is looking forward to getting into touring. Personally, I think there's a little bit of maturity required to leave the ski area boundaries. Do you have any advice for parents wanting to get their kids into touring? For sure. Um, the best thing to do is wait. Um, I, my dad and mom are both quite big outdoor enthusiasts. And for as long as I can remember, my parents have been hiding transceivers around the house under couch cushions um on different levels and i've been playing with the transceiver since i was probably five years old so by the time i was 14 and learned how to cross that boundary safely i had very good knowledge of how to use those tools um the best thing i can say is wait until you feel confident that they could dig you out um you don't want to go back there with a kid that could be a liability for for yourself um and also understanding that um people can cause avalanches on top of you so if you're not traveling in the in the train um safely and smartly that can uh, cause a great deal of danger on yourself so taking asd course before you're heading out there or playing around in your backyard digging for uh transceiver learning how to use your shovel and probe efficiently um is kind of all I can say, but yeah, just just wait until they're mature enough and you feel really confident about their skills and knowledge to cross that boundary. Great, thanks, Amy. That's it from the chat box for now. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for listening. And uh, we, I think we've got Greg up next. How's it going, hey, everyone? See you, Amy. Thanks a lot. Uh, Nick, on your point though uh, about bindings, I think for kids the bindings are the tough one because you want to make sure that they can release quite well. I have a 13 and a, uh, so excuse me, a 14 year old tomorrow and a 15 year old, and it's the release values that I think are the concern on bindings. Pin bindings might not release easy enough. So, um, but yeah, the rest of the gear is definitely the same for for kids. Um, before I really get into this, I want to kind of figure out who you guys are that are out here watching this. So Brent, if you can throw up the first uh, poll, I'd like to see what people. Um, people are all about. So yeah, if you guys can answer this quickly, it just gives me a bit of perspective on who you are and what I what you really want to learn tonight. Because um, talking to a screen, I have no idea. And it's quite interesting because there's 174 of you, and yet I don't see any of you. So if you guys can quickly answer these two first questions, it'd be great. We'll do this one first. Um, yeah, I guess it was supposed to be a zero too. If you, if you do, oh damn. That, if you do have no experience, I'm sorry, you can't really answer this. Um, but yeah, I think it's a big deal trying to figure out how to go beyond the ropes. Um, five to 10 days, excellent. And Brent, can we pop up the next one too? So yeah, uh, part of, learning about mountains is figuring out your mountain sense and the best way to develop mountain sense is through mentorship and courses and um you know with avalanche canada they've got ast1 ast2 and and caa itp level one and higher they've got a ton of courses for you to take so it's 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 a great way to start your learning process and i can tell you it's a long 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 road awesome thanks brent 
Well, thanks, you guys. Yeah, that gives me a perspective because, you know, 50% of you have kind of toured five to 10 days, same 50% of you have taken your AST1. So you're kind of all at the start of the learning curve. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my learning curve just to kind of give you a perspective on how to gain your own mountain sense and kind of how to develop yourself into a, into a ski mountaineer, I guess. Um, bear with me here. I'm going to show, share my screen and ideally find my presentation. So what do you need to know to go beyond the ropes? And I think that's, that's a huge question because it's, it's endless, like I was saying. It's nice that you guys are getting your AST and you're learning a bit, but there's a ton to know. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. This is me. I, I love skiing. I've been skiing since I was two, backcountry skiing for quite a long time, since 1995. And, and it's just this otherworldly experience that really fuels me and, and inspires me. And I, I just, I honestly, I can't get enough. Um, you know, nothing like fine hiking for hours just to get that incredible turn. And this one had more than one incredible turn after another, another, it's just, there's something, there's nothing quite like it. And then the whole challenge of trying to figure out how to do it safely and, and, you know, group dynamics and everything. It's not, it's not just about the turn. It's about so many other things that make that one turn fulfilling, but it's just multi, multifaceted. Um, over the years, I climbed a million feet in a season. I climbed 50,000 feet in a day. I've done all these incredible, well, in my mind, I think they're incredible. I pushed myself to all these limits to just really see what my potential was. And, you know, in 2010, I climbed and skied 2 million feet, which was 77 summits and, and um, 280 days of touring that year. And it was just this endless, endless expression, uh, adventure. And you can kind of see I'm skinny and, and wrung out, but I'm also super excited and, and still passionate about skiing at the end of that long year. Um, you know, I've traveled around the world. I've skied in Norway. This one was with Chris Rubens. This is probably his shot. Um, you know, I've skied in Jackson Hole. I've definitely experienced Jackson at its best. Um, I've been to Japan and, and gotten some incredible turns there. And, you know, I've been really fortunate because I work with, with all these different companies, in this case, Arcteryx, to go and get the shot of the, the glove sticking out of the powder. And, you know, I'm definitely traveling the world. I'm skiing all around BC and you know, first descents all all around all around my house here and around the world. And you know, I'm definitely super experienced. And you know, I've skied to 7,000 meters in the Himalayas. I've I've seen seen backcountry skiing, ski mountaineering everywhere. And you know, I uh, over the years just to gain experience and kind of develop myself. I've got C Canadian Avalanche Association Level Two, and I'm a ski guide with the ACMG. And I've got 21 plus years of backcountry experience. And um what's what's interesting about this is i want you guys to answer the, the next poll because here i am a super experienced person and i want to see what you do with this next one brent can you throw it up this is a really ex interesting one because it's it's the expert halo and i really want to figure out how where you guys would fit on it because there's this sort of this unspoken hierarchy of experience and and i'm really curious to see what you guys would think with you know like you know, i was looking at you guys have 50% of you are five to 10 days, 50% of you AST1, and here's some guy who's got a ton of skills. So if I was out and we were pushing the limits a bit and you were starting to feel uncomfortable, would you voice it and actually question my decisions? And it's obviously tough to tell from our living rooms whether you would, but it, it's more the idea behind the expert halo. So this is good. So. 55% of you said you would question it. And I think that is the biggest thing is that regardless of any of our experience out there, it's it's a group experience and and you need to ask. And for me, for years, one of my partners was Aaron Chance. This I meant to have a picture of him, but I don't. But he was the questioner. And I would, I'm I'm extremely motivated, I'm extremely driven, and I, I can kind of get a little bit of blinder going because I want to ski that line. I want to do this this mountain I've never done. But Aaron would always question me, and he was the antidote to my weaknesses because his questions, I would have to answer them with clear thought out answers that would overcome his fears and mine too, but overcome those questions to then ski it. We turned around a ton, but it's that idea that, that we always need to question each other. We actually, we need to keep each other accountable and to just expect, oh, there's Greg Hill, he's the experienced guy, and to let me make all the decisions doesn't, it doesn't end well. Um, I'll lead on to that in a little bit, but the, the next question is, is like how, let's see, sorry, 
how do you gain experience? And this is this is a big step because everyone here is looking to gain more experience. And it, it's a long road. So I'm going to quickly delve into my road and what I did because there's some great learnings along the way. I grew up in Quebec. It powed a lot there in my mind. I didn't really know anything, but I came out west super inspired. My first backcountry skiing was up at Duran Glacier Chalet, Selkirk Mountain Experience. And here I am in 1995, putting on my skins for possibly the first time. Um, I had no idea at the time that it was gonna become my passion for the rest of my life. I was at university and I was just kind of, you know, living life and saved up some money to go on this experience with my parents. Um, yeah, there I am in green, just like squinting and excited about probably the first summit I've ever ski toured to. Um, you know, back then, 95, the gear was totally different as Chris is gonna explain in a little bit, but the fact is, is it was all about the passion and everything. And I remember looking at Rudy here and thinking like, how does this guy take the group of us who are totally inexperienced and how does he take us comfortably into this hazardous mountain terrain? And I, I read through my journal from those days and, and I was, I never thought for a moment that for from my 20s to my 45 now, I would just, this would be my life. I was watching him and I was thinking, how does he do this? How does he have the comfort level to, to just take us all out there and make sure we're safe? And, and it, it took me a long time to figure it out, but I, I went back to climbing and, you know, that was my passion forever. And I, and luckily or unluckily, my shoulder dislocated. And then I started putting all my focus from climbing into ski touring and started to try to figure out the mentorship and what I could learn along the way. <clears throat> and sorry, a little sip of wine. What I learned is that um, for mentorship, for learning for this mountain sense, is that really I wanted to learn from all sorts of different people to develop my own. So I grab a little bit from Rudy, a little bit from Canadian Ski Guide, a little bit from the CAA, and eventually develop my own skills. Um, but what really rammed it home is in my first avalanche course, I'd done my, I'd worked at Sunshine Village, I'd skied Delirium Dive the first year it opened, and we were, the, we were the people that would go and ski cut, and I learned a ton from the patrollers there. But then it was time for me to gain experience on my own. I was living in Whistler, and I was doing a ton of touring, but I really, I knew nothing. And then December 7th, I was here at the bottom of this, midway through this avalanche path, and we were doing an avalanche course, digging pits, and all of a sudden the guide looks up and he says, avalanche. And I look up and this, this whole slope above everything that's in the sun essentially collapsed. Um, it was triggered by some friends of mine that eventually, uh, you know, they suffered incredible injuries. One person died, four of them were quite injured. My buddy Frank almost died that day also. And he still suffers from tons of issues from that day. Um, but really what that day rammed home for me is this, this idea that the mountains are, are dangerous. And we all have to understand that we kind of have to make a pact with the mountains. Um, if you look up the definition of adventure, you can see that it's an unusual and exciting, typically hazardous experience or activity. Um, quite often it involves risk. And I think what we all have to do is we have to, oh, sorry, we have to make a pact with the mountains, understanding that if stuff happens, like with all the great things that happen in the mountains, there's going to be some bad. There's the yin and the yang. And that the fact is, is that it's so great, but yet there is this, this possibility of death, of mistakes. So I think if you're somebody who's starting to be an adventurer, you have to look yourself in the mirror and understand that shit can go wrong and you have to be ready for it. And you have to actually mentally be ready for it. Um, the other day I was wandering in the slack country off the ski hill, which to me, slack country is only called slack country because it takes a little less effort. The second you cross that rope, it's hazardous out there. It's mountains, it's no, there's nothing tame about it. And I stumble upon these three guys and I'm looking at them and I'm like, oh, it doesn't really look like they're too savvy. One of them doesn't have a backpack. The other guy doesn't, you know, they just don't seem prepared. So I kind of try to question them a bit and I can, oh, you know, oh yeah, we we're going to put on our beacons, turn our beacons on. And two of the three people had a beacon, the third guy didn't. And I was sitting there and I, I was alone, but I've got 20 plus years of experience and I was using the train appropriately, but I didn't want to say too much because it seemed a bit hypocritical, but I asked one of the guys, the guy without a beacon or a backpack, and, and he said, I trust my friends and they say it's okay. And to me, that, that blew my mind because I looked at him, I said, no, you are making this decision. You are the one that's accountable if anything goes wrong. Yes, they're more experienced than you, but you're the one that's deciding to be out here 
without a beacon, without anything, and just trusting your friends. And I think it it's up to us to decide to be the best partners we can possibly be. And in, in that situation, those guys were definitely in the wrong. I talked to them a bit about it. I know they talked to their roommates about it later. And ideally they learned something because you should not be out there, if one, if you're not prepared and trusting all your friends to make the decisions because it, it's up to you to learn what's happening out there. Um, over the years, I've, I've seen some pretty wild things. And this one, this is more about the pack. This is more about understanding that with amazing times in the mountains comes some terrible times. And I went to climb uh, Manaslu, the eighth highest mountain in the world. And there was this crazy lineup and there were all these people. And I really didn't figure that they knew much about the mountains. And, and here's Greg, Remy, they're all on their way up. on the, And it's, this is the last photo of the guy in the white glasses and the second guy. They both passed away in the, in the mountains that day. All these people in the background were caught in an avalanche sleeping that day. So there was this whole idea that they didn't have, that when I was talking to them and stuff, they didn't seem to understand the risks they were taking by sleeping in that avalanche path. Um, a lot of it kind of came to a, a whole head when I went to Pakistan and I'm this little dot in the middle of the mountain here. And I totally made a huge mistake. I had the wrong partners. They didn't question me. And I went and skied this slope that possibly I shouldn't have had for the mountains. Uh, for the conditions and everything, and I got caught in a huge slide. Like, look at me, from here to zero, I'm in the middle of this thing, and it's just, I managed to escape, got tumbled down, crashed down for 1,500 feet, somehow managed to swim to the side and survive. And it was quite wild, broke my leg, and none of my friends that were there, none of the group had any avalanche, uh, sorry, first aid experience, and I had to teach them how to traction my leg, my shattered tib fib. Um, so, Coming back from that and healing from it, I really decided that there's this need for a process. And I've got these these videos that I'd love you to take a look. But the biggest takeaway was that you need a process and you need the best partners and you need to be the best partner ever. Uh oh, what happened there? Hello, Greg. It looks like you may have froze up. Definitely a good look for him, though. All right. Yeah, good comment, Chris. Um, well, hopefully Greg is um, just as technically um, knowledgeable as he is mountain knowledge. Um, with these good old webinars, we tend to have glitches. And unfortunately, Greg is frozen in time briefly. He may hopefully log out, log back in, and we'll have him back on. Um, but with that being said, I guess we could continue on and uh, move into Mr. Chris Rubens. Um, hopefully, Greg will come back on, and we might have a bit of a shuffle back and forth with these two guys. Um, I'm going to pass the controls over to Chris, if uh, we could fire you up here, Chris. Yeah, and, sounds uh, good. While you're doing that, I'll uh, shoot Greg a text and uh, see what's happening on his end here. I'm just gonna. Oh, and I'm still here. Oh, there oh. we go. Look at that. Just in time. We're just about to I kick cannot... you to the curb, Greg. I... I sorry about that. My computer just decided to shut off for me. Um, I will be quick. Can I keep going, Brent? Wait, okay, sorry about that, Absolutely, you guys. Greg. As yep, my as we thought you'd completely froze up, what you did. So yeah, please continue. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. As you can see, as prepared as you can be, there's always things that are going to go wrong. Um, beyond the ropes, I mentioned this before, slack country, it's not slack country at all. It's only that it's a little easier to get to the alpine. Everything out there is serious. This is what these guys are finding in what you'd call the slack country today. Um, it was triggering avalanches everywhere. It's as serious as anywhere else the second you cross that rope. Um, what I want to quickly talk about, although I'm a little bit behind time, is that it's this daily process and I go through this every day and you look at this list and you should go through it every day. Getting the forecast is simple. Avalanche.ca, they've got great information. You look at it, figure out where you are at, figure out what's what's about. And it's just kind of putting those hazards or what the issues to the forefront of your mind. Because then when you start planning your trip, you take that information, you dream the biggest dream, but when you dream that big dream, you've got to have all these options along the way in case you see different conditions, in case it's it's what they say it is, or it's even worse, and you can't go that way. So 
just always have been decision points along the way. Um, check your gear. This is not only check your gear, but become the best partner you can. Like be prepared for an emergency, be the strongest teammate you can be. And that's where like being fit, having first aid and all these AST, AST one and two, like it's so important. And this is a big one. And this is what I'm going to talk about in a brief little minute here is that verify the conditions while you're out there, constantly be looking and thinking. And, and, and I, I quoted this from a friend of mine, we were talking and not really paying attention. This is not what you want to be saying to yourself after an avalanche. You want to be out there and you want to be thinking the whole time. Um, at some point, that I've, I've created a couple of videos, the seven terrain tricks. It just gives you some in, insight in, on terrain and how to travel around. One of the biggest things is always try to stand on the high points, stay out of the gullies. Avalanches flow like water, so if you can, you can stay high and safe, you're better. Um, this all becomes better with more knowledge, and it's the whole time you just want to be questioning. Um, and the best thing is, the more most important thing is at the end of your day to just really reflect, decide where you are most at risk and like discuss this with your partners because if you don't reflect on the day, you can't get better and you can't decide where you were making mistakes. Um, let's see, I'm gonna just show a little video, we'll see if it works. <laughs> and then, let's see if this works for you guys. Oh. I've got this W loop, wind, weather, warmth, and where am I? And that is constantly looping in my head because I need to constantly question what's changing all day and how those changes affect where I am. The biggest thing that causes avalanches is change. So the whole day I'm trying to assess change. What is changing? So weather, is it snowing? Is it sunny? And what are those changes? What is the wind doing? Well, how, is it, how is it changing the slopes that I want to climb or I want to ski? Uh, warm, is it getting a lot warmer? Is that changing things? Are cornices softening? Or is it getting colder and are things stiffening up? It's a loop that's going through my head and I'm wondering how these changes are affecting where I am and what I'm doing and I'm making the right decision. Loop all day, over and over and over. And that's what keeps you safe, questioning all day. I'm trying to show myself now. Where do I go? So yeah, that the is the gear I use for backcountry skiing. Uh oh, classic, classic mistakes, eh? So basically, what I'd like you guys to do is every day that you're out there, you want to become a detective. You want to. Can you guys see me? Yeah. You want to basically the whole day be looping and thinking weather changes like you get all the information but when you're out there like avalanche canada has information that's broad but when you're in your zones you have to be questioning everything all day and i think that's the biggest thing i'd like to leave you guys with is that it's it's up to you to be questioning up to you to be noticing the difference and and to be constantly looking and thinking and and 20 percent of you should be paying attention to what's happening should be scared should be like looking and questioning you can have 80 percent that's having fun enjoying the views and and loving it because it's incredible. But you need that 20% that is always analytical, questioning, fearful, and and double checking all your decisions because that'll keep you safe. Keep you safe. Um, what I'd what I'd love to do is just do my last little question, Brent. If we can do a poll, and this is where if you guys are heading out into the backcountry, you have to understand and make a pact with the mountains. And understand that stuff can go wrong and are you willing to accept those consequences and if you're not then maybe risk and adventure isn't what you should be doing because it, it something's going to go wrong at some point i was just talking to chris before and i've lost probably about eight acquaintances to the avalanches some closer friends but um over the years mistakes happen and so if you're not willing to make the pact with these mountains and understand that mistakes happen, then honestly, stay in bounds. That's my talk. 96%, <laughs> excellent. So when you make that pact, make also the pact that you are gonna learn as much as you can and be as prepared as you can so that if stuff goes wrong, you can respond appropriately. I love that you guys are willing to make that pact, but make the next pact with yourself to learn, and to get as many mentors as you can and to just learn along the way so you can have the most amazing times out there and that's that's my talk hopefully you guys enjoyed it
apart from me disappearing hey, for a couple. Craig, thank you. Um, I do have one question. It might have been addressed with your experience in Pakistan. Um, Nick asks, Greg, with all your experience, are there any recent experiences where you've made mistakes and what did you learn from these? Yeah, I mean, the Pakistan avalanche showed me one, that partners are key. If I'd had the right partners to question me, I probably wouldn't have skied there. They thought I was Greg Hill, the, the expert, and they just let me go do it. And possibly with more questioning, I might have skied it differently. I might have just ski cut it. But I learned that the process is really important and partners on that trip. Great. Thanks. Um, one more question from Marsh. How does your approach differ when you're skiing solo as opposed to when you ski with partners? Um, skiing solo is quite wild because there's no safety net and you have to make every decision with the understanding of the consequences and that if anything goes wrong, you, you're in trouble. Um, so it's all dependent on conditions. I do love skiing solo because you can make all your own decisions. You don't have to worry about anybody else around you and it, you can flow around the mountains. Um, obviously, you just need to have a much bigger safety net because it's just you. Thanks, Greg. Well, I'm gonna pass this on to Chris. I'm super sorry that my computer decided to die there, but I'm glad I was able to get back on fairly effortlessly. Oh, yeah, you, Chris. It's good, yeah, it's a good segue because I ski with Greg quite a bit and I definitely question him all the time. Um, it's awesome but, that you guys are so key, so. Yeah, it's, it's uh, and it's not questioning in a bad way. It's just like, let's let's talk about this. I'm not sure if I'm on the same page and then you end up with a really good discussion, so. Um, yeah. I don't know why I'm out here, Chris. Good luck. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, all right, can you guys see my screen? We're all good, good here. Chris. Awesome. Um, yeah, so that was uh, really interesting listening to Amy and Greg there, and I think they did an amazing job of kind of articulating some of the skills and the, the thought processes that go on um, into kind of backcountry skiing in general. Um, but definitely like, I think a lot of people in the industry right now have talked a lot about um, a lot of new people coming in and um, like kind of how we communicate that. And, and to me, um, backcountry skiing really is, it's not like, it's not like riding a bike. You're not like, okay, I'm just gonna like pick up, pick up this new sport and uh, I'll be pretty good at it like by the end of the year, you know? So it, it really is like this kind of lifelong thing. Like, um, and it's a really good thing to do slowly. It's not like something that you're like, oh, I wanna be like um, Greg Hill and like smash all this vert and stuff like that. Like it, it takes years and years of experience. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Rubens. I grew up in the Rockies and I've lived in Revelstoke for a really long time now, uh, probably like 13 years. Um, and somehow I've been a professional skier for almost two decades. So i uh, definitely seen a lot of things and a lot of, uh, had a lot of experiences for sure, both good and bad. Um, but yeah, so what what I'd like to do is kind of go into the history um, of like kind of how we got to this point, because um, definitely some of it, I lived through this kind of progression of, of where we're at now. Um, I obviously didn't live through this part. Um, kind of ski touring, the earliest, um, the earliest like skis that they found is, is Norway and China. And, and it, it was for traveling and, uh, hunting, you know, that kind of thing. And then slowly it, it, it changed. And on a like total side note, like some of the earliest skis they found are like these fat rockered skis. It's kind of cool. And then all of a sudden we went to these, uh, kind of straighter skis and you can see this handsome young fellow. He's, you know, like our classic ski mountaineer. He's got his binoculars ready and probably not enough rope to do a whole lot, but, um, this sport has been around for a really long time and people have been doing it, uh, quite well. Um, so kind of when I grew up, this was one of my childhood idols, Scott Schmidt. And uh, you can see like other than the lack of his toque that he doesn't have um, is his long straight skis. And it was like cooler to have longer and straighter skis back then. Um, but what these, the, the big difference between uh, then and now is that you had to be a really good skier to be able to ski these skis. It was quite challenging to ski them and to ski them in powder and ski them well was even more challenging. So that just kind of naturally kept people out of the backcountry that way. 
um so it was yeah it's kind of the, this thing um yeah and i definitely dabble uh in straight skis from now and now and then I, I love the old school but then along came this guy shane mcconkey and and to be clear here i'm not a historian but uh this is kind of how i see it i guess and i think it's fairly accurate but uh i'm sure a lot of you guys know this guy um total legend in the ski world and he was like pushing really hard to get away from um these like straighter skis that are out there i mean i think the vocal explosive was starting to come out now and what he did to prove a point was he mounted up these water skis and he took them to alaska and i don't know if you guys have seen it it's in a matchstick movie and he slid um he like kind of side slipped in two turns down this huge alaska face like something that nobody had ever done you know that would have been like a a hundred jump turns uh like three years previous so this was like a game changing moment and and he came out with the spatula shortly after that and basically created this this new movement into rockered fat skis that we all know today and the biggest difference with that is it made us all be able to ski powder um powder became way more enjoyable it was like you didn't have to be such a good skier to be able to ski powder uh like even people like me could ski powder now um and as you can see the popularity grew this is whistler peak chair opening i don't know if anyone have been here if you look in the crowd there uh, a lot of people are on fat skis rockered skis they're super fired up but as you can see the there's tracks all over the mountain so it gets busier and busier your friends are you know there are friends on a powder day fortunately um but it's kind of this natural progression that you get this feeling um of skiing powder inbounds and you're like get skied out inbounds and you're like all right like where's next and you start looking out of bounds you're like okay there's there's no tracks out there like let's go out there and, or maybe you do see a track and you're like well you just follow that um but that's kind of how i've seen like the the natural progression of of this like uh enthusiastic movement to the backcountry um so the other side of it so that's kind of like the history of it um but gear has been like a really really big part of this as well um so i mean i'm not that old i'm i'm 36 but actually my first uh first time going ski touring with my parents was in leather uh telemark boots up on the left there uh so that's not that long ago um and then you know we kind of moved over to these like at boots um paired with like the low tech binding in in the the bottom corner there but always the problem from for myself um was that i would get into these boots and they were just like they you would fold them you couldn't ski the way you wanted to um so like a lot of my like after the telemark thing but like into my foray of of kind of uh ski touring and whatever i was on actually alpine trekkers a very similar setup to what you see in the middle there and uh, a lot of people call them alpine day wreckers we had them all modded out like took out these things tried to make them lighter but for us it was so important um the the downhill side of things was was really important to us so um we definitely like cherish that over the the lightweight and then you come into today and you have these amazing boots that can go down just as well as they can go up you can ski them the, the ski hill you have the shift binding for example like you can shred hard on groomers all day and all of a sudden you're um you're like okay let's go for a skin in the afternoon and and uh it's it's really easy to do that so technology has like a really big part and like as soon as like the the ski industry started shifting into like putting money and energy into like developing these products they, they changed really quickly and, and all of a sudden we have uh this equipment that that works really well um now on the same token uh the it's kind of gone the same for for uh avalanche uh safety gear so on the top left there um and, and i'm definitely no expert in this but this is definitely one of the first uh rescue beacons um and you can see i don't know what you would actually plug that into like maybe a car battery or something like that but you have the earpiece um, I'm definitely familiar with the one in the middle there, the peeps. Um, that was kind of like the first um, kind of like one that you could like fit normally on your body. 
Um, and then on the on the right there, you see kind of the transition of where it is. Like I kind of came into the world with the F1 there, which was uh, an analog beacon, and and you it was quite challenging to use. You know, you had to really um, play with it or train with it quite a bit um, to really understand like how it worked and and the nuances of it. And then you go to today, we've like started going into avalanche or into a uh, digital beacons and now we're into three antenna beacons and the new beacons are like so much easier to use you still do need to like train and like know how to use these things for sure but like compared to where we've come from these are much better and it's like one of the places that you just like it's not worth skimping um in in your price you know it's it is really worth getting like the three antenna best beacon out there um, and then, and then we've had these new technologies that kind of come in on the side of like uh, if if everything does go wrong and you are caught in an avalanche. So you have the Avalon; it gives you a little bit of um, extra. If you, if you can get that little nozzle in your mouth when you're in the avalanche, you can have a little bit more breathing. So hopefully your rescuers can get you in time. Um, and the big one is the airbag. Um, so that's come out. Uh, it's definitely saved quite a few lives. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the downside is they are heavy. And both of the two on the, actually this whole page for that matter, these are all things that you don't actually ever want to use um, when you're out there. It's really good to know how to use them, but that's kind of the end of that. You, do, you don't ever want to have to use them. Um, so how I feel like one of the biggest changes that's going it's it's been going on for quite a while now but it, it's going it's continuing and i think it'll be probably our biggest development is kind of the human factor and so it's like how we present information so like avalanche canada behind the scenes when they're doing their bulletins they're taking a crazy amount of information that they get from all the heli ski operators the cat ski operators the ski tours all, all that sort of thing and, and they're putting that into a bulletin and so we're like they're doing a ton of research into like how it is best conveyed to people but also it is within group sites so if you take like a any of the avalanche courses that that are out there there's a huge part of the human dynamic um when greg's talking about um you know the export halo and stuff like that that's a studied thing and and it's really important to be able like within your group be able to chat about all these things so um I think most avalanche professionals or people that spend a lot of time in the backcountry are very fortunate, like like myself, like the friends that I hang out with, we're talking about it all the time. We're texting the night before to decide where to go in the morning and the drive up. And then all through the day, it's just a very natural conversation for us. You know, you, you can be talking about life at home, but um, you can really like quickly switch over to like, okay, what about, like check out that avalanche over there i didn't see that before you know so it's like always just like vocalizing everything but but that's like a really really important part of it because um inevitably i mean to some to some degree if you are in a scenario there was a human factor where something went wrong um, so this is like definitely i would say like a really big focus right now is to like figure out our mindsets of like how we can go about these things better um and so like the things that have not changed at all through all this and so on the left you you see us digging a pit and so that's gathering data so um that's like the most obvious way to do it is to put your head in the snow and see what's going on but we have the avalanche bulletins you have local coffee shops you have a uh, ski patrol or guides all sorts of people that you can ask and and basically with this stuff is like you want to get as much information as possible before you make these decisions in the mountains it makes like you know there's no there's no black and white in the mountains i mean i mean there are sometimes but it's pretty rare there's you know you're always kind of in the gray area so as much information as you can gather makes that decision making that much better uh, the other thing is is there's amazing technologies out there but we need to know how to use them. So the, the training part of it is huge. Uh, this is, these two photos are from the Solomon camp. Um, 
and we get together every year. I mean, this year is a little bit different, but um, the last you know five years, and we'll go through three days of training. Um, guides do it all the time every year, different scenarios and like super real life scenarios, getting, getting, um, burying full dummies and, and making sure we like have it totally dialed. And every time you do one of those, you learn something, no matter how experienced you are. Uh, so the, the training is, is, is essential for this whole, whole sort of thing. Um, yeah, I kind of breezed through there pretty quick, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I think there's a ton of new people out there and uh, I guess I kind of want to just leave it like the backcountry is amazing. It, it really is this incredible place to, to go out and this, especially with COVID, it's nice to go out there and get away from people and you can socialize with your friends and stuff like that. But it, but it is a really technical place that, that can't be taken lightly. So you can, you can have this like happy-go-lucky attitude, but always in the back of your brain, you're always switched on. Um, yeah, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I think we're gonna have some questions with everybody here as well. Yeah, Chris, um, I do have a question from, it's Chris. Um, he's wondering, where could I find information on what skis and accessories would be a good fit for me? Ooh, um, I mean, I mean, your local ski store is the best. <laughs> um, uh, and like, it, it's funny with like all the online shopping that goes on. Um, I, th I think especially like if you're like getting new ski boots or something like that, um, buying a ski boot at a local store and then it just gives them a lot more incentive to like make your setup work uh, for you. So I highly recommend going to like a local store um, if you don't, there's like definitely a ton of resources out there. Um, I know like most, I know Solomon has a bunch of videos of that sort of thing. I'm sure most manufacturers have that sort of thing or uh, um, most of us uh, pro athletes get uh, messages all the time on our social media about different skis and different setups and stuff like that. And for the most part, most people are super happy to help out and answer those questions. Thanks, Chris. Um, I have another question from Gary. Any advice for finding mentors or ski partners? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, mentors are huge. Um, and and that's something I've been super lucky with. Um, I would say that getting, um, going to these courses like AST1s, AST2s, any, any sort of thing like that, um, you're going to meet, meet like-minded people. Um, and normally they're taught by people that are really into like giving you education. So when you go into these courses, um, it, it, it really is like what you want to get out of it. Um, so ask all the questions and that's, that's most of my, um, education. I don't have a ton of formal education. I have a CAA level one, um, and that's kind of as far as I've gone. But every time I'm around, um, for me, it started with ski patrollers. Um, and I just like, you know, was was the local ski bum at the hill and just peppered them all the time with questions and stuff like that of like what they thought of this and what they thought of that and uh, what they thought of this layer. And then if I went out with someone more experienced, you know, it was like going back to the to Greg there um, with the expert halo is like I quest question them and it wasn't necessarily because I didn't disagree with, or I d disagreed with them. I just wanted to understand more. And th the other thing is if you are like a more experienced person, explaining that to someone will actually really help you uh, understand that. Like as I teach this stuff, it, you like have w a way better understanding of it all. I'm going to chime in here too, Chris. I think a good way to get mentorship is to go do a week at a ca at a lodge somewhere with a guide. And most Canadian guides are nice and open, and you should be able to question them the whole time and learn from them. Yeah, to yeah, was, yeah. Like just, I think even a day of guiding at the pass or something like that, like uh, like hiring Greg or Kapow or something like that, like the 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 newer style of guiding. If if you ask for it, you're like, I want to go out for like an educational day, like guides love it and they can just kind of do like that act of guiding day 
and it works super well and and just like seeing somebody and how they approach a decision making point like in real life is huge thanks you guys um either one of you could probably answer this next one it's from tyler once you have scoped a line and have decided you're going for it what is your root finding process for the skin up <laughs> it's a tough um, one to me. I like to take the easiest, safest route. I basically go up the slopes with the least consequence the whole time. Um, even if I'm skiing the biggest line, I typically try to take the smallest slopes the whole way to the top. Yeah, totally. Um, it's. I, I feel like it's pretty rare that you're dropping into something and you don't know how to get back out. Like, I, I wouldn't recommend that ever. Like you, you need to have looked at a map and have like an exit strategy. I mean, fortunately, a lot of the time with ski touring is like you're looking up at something, and then you know that that's a big part of of uh, decision making in the backcountry is like, okay, I want to go ski that ski that thing up there, and I feel good about it. How do I get up there? Because it's one thing about skiing something, and it's another thing about going up something. Uh, you're in it for way longer so it's it's definitely um, but i i personally like learned a lot from greg of like always going the easiest way around and um i grew up in the rockies so we just like boot pack straight up things and i've rarely seen greg do that so he's always looking for the easy way around the back and and i've learned a lot from that awesome thanks um chris another question for you at what point in your career did you feel you could transition from being mentored to a mentor? Was it a quantifiable amount of time? No, no, I don't, I don't feel, yeah, I don't feel like I've reached that <laughs> point, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I definitely feel like, I mean, once you've been around for a while, you definitely start mentoring people, but I, I, my closest ski buddies i would consider mentors like I, I learned so much from them all the time um the that's kind of the beauty about backcountry ski, ski touring and kind of the, the idea that i like to portray is like your your learning is never over you know like i was out in the backcountry today those pictures that greg showed that that was um for me and there's his avalanche ranch out there and uh the first run we did it was totally fine second run it was like whoa what just happened like and it, you know, it, it you you get caught off off guard, or uh, things hopefully don't surprise you too much. But uh, yeah, it's a constant learning place. Thanks, guys. I've got a question from Jamie, who wants to know how often do you wax your setup, especially wearing skins for the better part of the day? I think we need to bring Amy back too. I'm kind of missing her in our little panel here. There she is. Hey. <laughs> I don't ever wax, so I shouldn't answer this question. <laughs> my dad's still super into waxing my skis, so I shouldn't either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so I had this experience, like, I mean, it was probably 10 years ago now, but I waxed my skis and then I didn't scrape them all enough. And then I put skins on and then all the wax came off on the skins and I ruined like a pretty much brand new pair of skins. And so that ever since then, I've kind of been like scared of it. Um, but I really, really enjoy fast skis in the backcountry. Like when you're slogging across the flats and stuff like that, it's such a pain in the butt uh, when you have slow skis. So yeah, uh, if you do wax your skis, which I recommend, um make sure you get all your wax off that's that's my pro tip <laughs> awesome gang thanks that's pretty you pretty much well covered it from the chat here unless brent's got something yeah i got nothing questions from the floor so i think you guys have pretty much covered it great well thanks everybody for tuning in i think i speak for the yeah, I think I'm speaking for the three of us. If you have questions, just reach out to us on social media or whatever, and I'm pretty sure we're all open to helping anybody get out and learn as much as we can. 
For sure, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining, everyone. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Awesome, folks. Well, big thanks to Amy, Greg, and Chris for those great presentations and the discussion. And I hope uh, a bunch of you folks got some information out of there. Um, we just want to remind you that, you know, another good way of information is avalanche.ca. It's a one-stop avalanche shop. You know, right now we just released a new online avalanche tutorial called Avi Savvy. And if you're not familiar or have no training, you got to hit the website and at least go to that for the minimum. You know, um, get familiar with the daily forecast. Read it like it's your morning newspaper. You need that information to go out on a daily basis. You know, there's a lot of at stake when you get out of bounds. As these folks have been saying, once you cross the rope, you're on your own. You're, it's all up to you and your friends and you're your own your own uh, saviors out there. So be prepared with yourself and your group. At the minimum, take an AST1 course, education for self-preservation, right? If you already have that AST1, go take your AST course, keep continuing your education, find those mentors, find those friends, find those people that are like-minded out there. You know, if you got an AST2 course, when's the last time you practice your companion rescue skills? There's a one day course, the companion rescue skills course. There's managing avalanche train course, another one day course. There's a lot of information that you can gain just by taking these courses. Even if you've taken an AST one, maybe go and repeat it. We want you folks to stay safe and watch out for each other out there. We really appreciate your interest in avalanche safety. So happy that you attended tonight. You can support all essential programs like this by donating as little as 10 bucks to Avalanche Canada. There's a link in the question chat box. You can just click on there. It'll take you to a donate page. It's hugely appreciated on our behalf. Our next webinar, Thursday, December 23rd, just before Christmas, folks, we're gonna do a long range update with our forecasters. And they're gonna talk about what the avalanche conditions are gonna be, or hopefully gonna be, on the holiday season in the various regions. So we're gonna give a little breakdown on what's happening out there just prior to that Christmas break. Pre-registration is required. And thank you all for coming out tonight. We really appreciate you folks attending. Hope you have a fantastic festive season. Cheers.